I, I will just admit into the Zoom room our next two guests and let's see if they can join us. So we have Kenneth Timmis and Joanna Varan just joining us for the next session. So this begins our education session. So for the next two hours, we're going to be talking about education with microbes and approaches to education in primary, secondary and uh, higher education and also public engagement. Um, thank you so much, Kenneth, for joining us. I know you're pressed for time and a very, very busy man. Um, so I just will give you a short introduction and let you get on with your talk to avoid delaying you in any way. Um, so Kenneth Timmis is a professor at the Technical University of, I'm going to butcher this name, Brauschweig, Brauschweig? <laughs> Brauschweig uh, University um, in Germany and joins us from that town and is going to be giving us a, a beautiful talk about improving microbiology literacy in society. Um, so if we just check, you can share your screen. We'll set you off on the talk. Joanna is joining me as my co-host for uh, this hour. And so you'll see more of her later uh, as we discuss different aspects of education. Okay, it is a pleasure to uh, have been invited to talk about the International Microbiology Literacy Initiative on this very special day of the International Microorganism uh, Day. Um, so, oh, why doesn't, ah. so the, um, this initiative was launched uh, with an editorial in environmental microbiology um, in 2019 entitled The Urgent Need for Microbiology Literacy in Society. So what I'd like to do today is to um, discuss a little bit why society needs to become microbiology literate, how society may become microbiology literate, the International Microbiology Literacy Initiative School Curriculum and Resources, and then a few concluding remarks. So why does society need to become microbiology literate? So I've uh, listed a number of uh, things that I believe are important, and, uh, but there will be others, of course. So the first is planetary importance. So microbes are pervasive in their activities and in fact affect the planet in, in many different ways. Just a couple of examples, they generate a quarter of the oxygen which is respired in the biosphere. Uh, they recycle most of the waste that the biosphere generates, and they're responsible for uh, two thirds of oceanic uh, carbon fixation, which is obviously very important for uh, greenhouse gas fluxes and, uh, and global warming. So microbes are the life support system of the biosphere, and we ignore them at our peril. The second uh, reason is crisis importance to minimize preventable crises and to mitigate unpreventable crises. So microbes are at the center of multiple intertwined crises we face. And I've list just listed a few here. Uh, there are obviously others, but these are really important. Anti antimicrobial resistance, resurgence of all diseases, pandemics of new diseases, starvation and food security, the soil crisis, we are losing uh, fertile soil uh, globally uh, at a high rate at the moment, uh, the clean air crisis in urban environments, clean water crisis in many parts of the world, global warming we're familiar with, waste crisis, pollution crisis, eutrophication crisis, and sustainability crisis. So in order that policy makers and decision takers respond to crises, they must understand the causes and remedies and they must become microbiology literate. So just a couple of examples of crisis importance. So vaccine hesitancy. So these diseases are coming back, increasing in frequency, measles, whooping cough, diphtheria, diseases that were virtually eradicated and they're um, are coming back because of uh, vaccine hesitancy, because of parental concern about vaccine risks. And these concerns are exacerbated by misinformation and conspiracy theories. And as a result, herd immunity is decreasing and infection rates are rising. Well, knowledge, knowledge is power. Knowledge counteracts information, prejudice and conspiracy theories. The second example I want to give is the mitigation of unavoidable crises, namely 
pandemic preparedness and the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic management. So COVID-19 or something like it has been predicted for many years and uh, there's been an increasing probability of it happening with increasing interactions of humans uh, with wildlife. Many countries are fully aware, were fully aware of this and they had prepared strategies to deal with it. Surprisingly, therefore, most countries were totally unprepared for the pandemic. And as we all know, the uh, major problems consisted of supply of uh, personal protective equipment to frontline medical professionals, which meant that they often caught the disease and we had a reduction in, in capacity in our medical systems. And most importantly, the key issue of transmission was poorly understood by many. And this resulted in disparate instructions being issued by the various governments, causing confusion in the population. And of course, this was all compounded by misinformation campaigns. Now, I don't know what the current numbers are, but uh, the, uh, obviously we have a very large number of cases of COVID and we have a very large number of fatalities. So if politicians had understood the seriousness of the predicted pandemic and they had listened to the experts, we could have been much better prepared and managed transmission in a much better way. The third example I want to give is socioeconomic importance. So microbe-based processes and technologies contribute substantially to societal well-being. Examples given here, health, so microbes are sources of new therapies, vaccines and diagnostics. They're sources of new chemicals and materials. They enable the production of energy from renewables and wastes. They are sources of food. Uh, they are they enable uh, fermented foods to be prepared and they are sources of flavorings. They're crucial to agriculture and crop yields because they um, are very important to plant health and they can promote um, plant growth and suppress disease. They enable uh, environmentally friendly recovery of natural resources, a process called biomining. And obviously they're central to waste management because they are important biodegraders of wastes, uh, remediation of contaminated environments, and they enable recycling of resources through bioconversions. And they, are, they represent an expanding commercial sector um, in the sector and in the activity in the, in, the, in the sector of biotechnology. So microbial technology is high tech, it's innovative, it's problem solving, it's rapidly growing importantly, and it's a significant sustainable driver of creation of enterprises and employment. It represents the core of the new bioeconomy. Microbiology literacy is important for sustainability because microbial processes are currently crucial in efforts to attain the sustainable development goals. And they will assume increasing importance as innovation drives uh, in development of new technologies in very different sectors. I've listed the uh, sustainable development goals here and highlighted in red uh, those which are impacted uh, most uh, importantly by uh, microbial activities. But in fact, all of the sustainable development goals are impacted to some extent by microbial activity. So we've already dealt with hunger and health, uh, clean water, energy and employment, but we also have uh, sustainable consumption of natural resources, climate change we've seen, uh, the protection of marine resources and the protection of terrestrial ecosystems. And then microbes have a very uh, significant importance to individuals and to us personally, because they're part of us. So we and all other uh, organisms on the planet are covered in microbes. These are our microbiomes, and these provide us with essential services and regulate to a significant extent organism well-being. So microbiomes are the life support systems of individuals. And again, we ignore them at our peril. And to update Descartes, who formulated the famous phrase, I think, therefore I am, we have to update it uh, to, I think, therefore we are. 
So to uh, put a little uh, meat on the on the bones of the issue of personal um, microbiology and the the implications for uh, evidence-based uh, everyday decisions, a few examples. So whether to elect for a cesarean, an aseptic, or a natural delivery birth. Here the issue is the transfer, microbiome transfer between mother and baby, which is crucial for uh, development of a healthy gut microflora, which will orchestrate the development of the immune system. Uh, on, on the same line, whether to, um, to breastfeed or formula feed the infants, because human milk oligosaccharides, again, orchestrate the uh, structure of the microbiome and its immune training, whether to use powerful disinfectants and how frequently, uh, because they reduce the microbial diversity of the home and the diversity of the home uh, also regulates the microbial diversity of us. Whether to be vaccinated against an infection, that means avoiding the infection, or to take the risk that we have it and then to be, um, and then to, to have the, uh, the, uh, the morbidity, uh, inconvenience, and uh, possibly worse, uh, uh, and the need uh, to, to treat the disease. So whether to prevent or to treat the disease. This is an important issue also to concern, uh, concerning vaccine hesitancy. Whether to use phosphorus containing household cleaning products because phosphorus is a diminishing resource and ultimately it gets into surface and groundwaters and causes eutrophication where it, where it ends up. Whether to use germicidal soaps, which perturb the skin microbiome and its important barrier function. Whether to acquire a companion dog. The positive effect here is that a dog will increase microbial diversity of the home and therefore increase uh, our, the diversity of our microbiomes. But there are other issues as we'll see in a moment. The choice of the food to eat, whether we eat beef and lamb, and if so, how frequently, because they carry a significant carbon environmental footprint. Uh, the provenance of our food, the shelf life of the food, the associations with known risks, how to store our food and prepare it, and how much to ventilate. Just think of the SARS transmission issue, or humidify or dehumidify our homes. These are, these are everyday decisions that we're confronted with and where a knowledge of microbiology will help us make evidence-based decisions. So microbiology literacy is essential to transit from ignorance-based decisions and chance-based outcomes to knowledge-based stewardship of our lives, the biosphere and the planet. And the aim of the International Microbiology Literacy Initiative is to provide this knowledge and thereby become an enabler of responsible stewardship. Well, I've talked quite a bit about literacy. So what is literacy? Well, here is a, a definition from the UNESCO. It's the ability to identify, understand, interpret, create, communicate, and compute using printed and written materials associated with varying context. Literacy involves a continuum of learning. So learning is a key word here. So, Learning can occur throughout life, but tends to be concentrated in formal education and during childhood, early adulthood. In essence, its product, in other words, the product of learning is literacy. And it is the qualification of adulthood with all its challenges and responsibilities. So literacy is best acquired in school through incorporation of the subject into the curricula. Qualification of adulthood, what does that mean? to understand our world, humanity, our needs, risks, and so on, to assess and develop informed objective policies at the individual level, community, family, national, international level, to make rational and accountable decisions, decisions which are understandable by everyone, to take productive, accountable actions, to assume our stakeholder responsibilities, and to participate fully in the family, the community and the wider society. This is the qualification of adulthood. So for teaching, we need resources. Well, in fact, there are many excellent microbiology resources out there, both online 
uh, ASM, FEMS, micro society, micro, uh, Microbiological Society, the Spanish Society for Microbiology, eBug, and many, many more. And uh, physical uh, resources like uh, exhibits by the University of Oxford and Harvard. But the formal incorporation of microbiology into school teaching requires the creation of a comprehensive microbiology school curriculum for different age groups and settings. So the goals of the International Microbiology Literacy Initiative are the following. To provide appropriate curricula for different age levels in diverse societal and cultural settings worldwide. To reveal the major planetary biosphere human processes and problems impacted or underpinned by microbial ecophysiological activities. To inform how these activities affect our well being and that of other members of the biosphere. So, in other words, how microbes affect us. But on the other hand, to reveal how microbial activities are influenced by our actions and the ensuing consequences, how microbes are in, impacted by us. To indicate how we may steer or exploit microbial activities for personal, human, planetary benefit and to contribute towards attainment of the sustainable development goals. And finally, to provide a perspective of our place in the wider world and how we are microbially connected in the global village and with the rest of the biosphere. So now I'd like to come to the, the IMLI curriculum. So it's important to, to note that the curriculum is child experience centric, child interest centric, child excitement centric. And it consists of the following class lessons, the topic frameworks, and I'll go into this in a moment. Multimedia teaching aids. So <clears throat> the big handicap we have as microbiologists in terms of communicating um, our, our, our science is that microbes are invisible. So for teaching, we need to visualize. And we do this through uh, teaching aids of various descriptions. Class experiments. So microbiology is so hands-on. Kids love uh, hands-on uh, activities. Home assignments to transport microbiology into the home. Class excursions to immerse children in the local micro microbiology where they can uh, experience uh, real, real microbiology in a local setting and to get them out of the classroom. And there are a number of other things in the, in the, in, in the, in the pipeline. Most importantly, all of the teaching resources that are being created will be freely available internationally. So let me come to the topic frameworks, which are the heart and soul of the, of the, of the strategy. These are basically the class lessons, but they're not prepared class lessons. The teacher has to prepare them. So what they consist that they are generic outlines of knowledge, they're generic frameworks of knowledge, which are adaptable to all age groups in all settings. They're written in non-specialist language for teachers. So the teachers are the target of the topic frameworks. The teachers can select the topic framework or select information within the topic framework that they consider to be interesting or important for their class, and they transmit and interpret it for different age groups and teaching needs. The topic frameworks are standalone, so different from typical curricula where you have to follow a set sequence, and if you miss out some parts of it, you are handicapped. In this case, the topic frameworks are standalone, so teachers can select and make their own collections, their own um, uh, groupings, of, um, of topics which they consider to be appropriate for their class and their purposes, their teaching aims. They can mix and match them. And actually they can take bits from one topic framework and uh, take bits from another one and uh, match, uh, mix and match them and thereby create new topic frameworks. The topic framework places the topic treated not only in its human and microbiological context, but also in the context of wider issues the grand challenges, sustainable development goals and societal problems. And they identify relevant decision issues impacted by the microbiology presented. 
The topics are grouped in uh, sections, uh, some of which are, are listed here, but not all. So our personal microbiology, where microbes play a role in um, our well-being, so body odor, toothache, acne, things which are important to children, our food, our plants, our animals, our well-being, health issues, our planet, our water, how microbes help us, the uh, topic of biotechnology, how microbes influence civilization and culture. So what microbes have done in the past to uh, create society that we recognize today. And finally, some background information on how we study them. So let me come to the topic framework. So the topic framework consists of a title page, which has a title and a child-centric question plus a relevant image to enable the teacher to catch pupil attention and establish um, child relevance and interest. There's a, there's a storyline, which is a short uh, description of the uh, TF content to enable teachers to rapidly um, browse the selection of uh, TFs and to make a choice of the ones that they want to use. Then you have the body of the uh, topic framework. Uh, which is basically consists of brief descriptions of microbial activities that underlie, control, or influence the issue discussed. Then we have a section on relevance for sustainable development goals, a section on potential implications for decisions at the personal level, community, national, international level. We have some pupil participation exercises, and then at the end we have what's called the evidence base. Um, uh, references, future reading and, and teaching aids. And finally, a glossary. Let me show you some uh, um, ex uh, uh, one example of a, a topic framework. So uh, this one is on pet dogs. So this is obviously not classic microbiology. This is a child centric topic. And the, uh, the question and the uh, image, Maisie has just been given a gorgeous little puppy for her birthday. Can we have one? And I think many families will have been confronted with this uh, question and many children will have posed this question. So it's relevant. So what do we have in this topic framework? Well, companion dogs uh, obviously bring in microbial diversity into the home. They increase exposure to microbial diversity. And as we know, uh, microbial diversity is very important for development of the healthy immune system. So this is uh, one of the positive aspects. Of course, there are a lot of uh, non-microbiological positive aspects to ownership of a pet dog, which I won't go into. But uh, like us, um, pet dogs can uh, become infected. Uh, some infections um, uh, are zoonotic, so uh, we can get infected from the animal. And uh, that means that we have to take our pet to the, the vet and um, have it treated. Of course, we can prevent disease, um, uh, some diseases by vaccination. So infections come up in this topic framework, vaccines and vaccination come up. And then our pet has to be fed and uh, a very considerable fraction of agriculture is devoted to the production of, uh, of dog food. And this consists of both uh, animal meat and grain. And if we think about this, one of the consequences is that this is diversion of uh, food production away from humans to, to animals. So this impacts on the, on the issue of food security and on the issue of starvation. In addition to that, um, all of the agricultural activities have a, an environmental footprint uh, with regard to greenhouse gas uh, production and also uh, eutrophication. And finally, dogs pollute the environment. So these are these are issues that um, that are that are microbiological that are relevant to ownership of a pet dog and that relate to discussions in the family about whether to uh, acquire one or not. Now we come to the relevance for sustainable development goals and grand challenges, and I've mentioned already the. Uh, this particular one, end hunger, achieve food security, and there are others that are discussed in this topic framework. And then we come to potential implications for decisions. So if we decide we will uh, have a, 
a dog in the family, uh, the question is, should it be a large one or a small one? Because the environmental and energetic footprint will be approximately proportional to the size. So if we're discussing the environmental aspect, the, the size of the dog will be relevant to that. Community policies. So I've mentioned um, pollution uh, in this particular case, pollution of public spaces and local water bodies with feces, nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen and phosphorus will um, contribute to eutrophication and so on. And then we have national policies relating to dog ownership, greenhouse gas production and global warming related to the production of dog food. And then we come to pupil participation. So a class discussion of issues associated with dog ownership, uh, pupil, pupil stakeholder uh, awareness. So dog ownership has a positive and negative, uh, has positive and negative consequences for the SDGs. Which of, which of these are in, most important to you, either personally or as a class? Can you think of anything that might be done to reduce negative consequences? Can you think of anything you might personally do to reduce the environmental footprint of your dog? And then we finish with the evidence base and the glossary. So uh, all of these issues that are brought up in the, um, in the topic framework are dealt with in sufficient detail to be able to uh, uh, explain uh, the issues and enable uh, people to discuss them when they're taking decisions. But of course, they may raise interest in, in the teacher or in the, in the child, uh, the children, um, uh, to, to have more information. And so we have obviously uh, topic frameworks that are dedicated to some of these things like the early microbiome, uh, like infections, like uh, vaccines and vaccination, antibiotics, so the treatment of the pet dog, antibiotics and antibiotic resistance in the environment, climate change, eutrophication. And then we have, a, of course, a lot of other topics um, which are unrelated to pet dogs. So dirt is good for you. So microbial diversity is good for you. Uh, Foodborne microbial disease. So more information about microbiomes, diagnostics, indigo, moisture damage and mold in our home. You see, all of these are child-centric. Um, um, volatiles and communication between microbes and between microbes and higher organisms. Um, food preservation. Recovery of resources from wastewater, red and green tides, fruit flies, microbial control of animal behavior. So those are some examples of the, of the TF. So uh, what is the current status of the uh, initiative? So um, we have something like 200 plus commitments for topic frameworks from authors. More than 150 of these have been submitted already. More than 80 have been completed. Uh, so I'm anticipating that the uh, core of the, um, the curriculum will be completed this year, but there will be others which are added later. The um, multimedia teaching aids, this is in progress. Uh, class experiments, this is um, in planning. We hope to complete that by 2023. Uh, suggestions for class excursions, that was already completed in 2020. And we have a, a small scale trialing of uh, topic frameworks in schools during the coming uh, school year. So the initiative is well underway. It involves a highly diverse group of players from many countries who provide very diverse outputs. It's attracting a lot of interest also from teacher relatives and friends who will carry out the initial uh, trials and provide feedback to us. I should emphasize that the TFs will not only serve for core curricula, a school curricula, but also for adult education and self-learning and importantly for university outreach. And while we're on the topic of universities, I think that TFs and their concept may also provide new ideas, both in terms of content and approach for university undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. But I should also emphasize that the aim of the IMLI is not to create microbiologists, but rather to create excitement and interest in microbes and their activities, and thereby adults equipped with the knowledge they need to make responsible decisions. Well, there are many things to do authoring of uh, more topic frameworks, creation of the MTAs, creation of uh, experimental protocols, translations of a few key documents, 
recruitment uh, of additional uh, teachers for trialing, engagement, most importantly, engagement of education ministries, authorities and agencies, and establishment of regional centers to promote and coordinate the IMLI. So if the IMLI excites or interests you and you'd like to contribute, do get involved. Here is my email address. And if you do get involved, you'll be joining many other well-known microbiologist uh, friends worldwide, including some of these, including all of these people and many more. And finally, I just want to say that attainment of literacy will depend on societal acceptance. And societal acceptance of microbiology literacy will depend on persuasion, realization of its practical value and collective excitement about new discoveries. And this persuasion must come from the experts, you and me, the microbiologists. We are excited by microbiology and excitement is infectious. We need to be transmitters of a global microbiology excitement infection. So on this special day, the International Microorganism Day, we must commit to the task of communicating to others the fact that microbes rock. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth, for that wonderful talk, detailed and wise and incredibly, incredibly uh, coherently delivered as well. Um, I believe you have to go before we can ask you too many questions. Um, but I just want to say, what are you going to be doing for International Microorganism Day tomorrow in celebration? Ah. Um, I am going to give a second um, talk um, ah. for the Portuguese Microbiology Society. The Portuguese Microbiology Society initiated the International Microorganism Day, and I'm very proud that they invited me to uh, make a presentation on, for them on that day. So this is the first thing I will do, and the second thing I will do is jump in the car because I have to uh, go to the UK for the first time in two years to visit family and friends. COVID has been a a dreadful thing for most people and I, I'm incredibly lucky that I haven't been uh, seriously affected but many many people have been uh, affected by the same issue of not being able to see family and loved ones and friends so this is what I'm going to catch up on tomorrow. Wonderful and uh, yeah I hope you have a good day and celebrate microbes with excitement, infectious excitement. Um, I guess that brings us, us on to the next stage of this education session Thank and we'll say goodbye to you Kenneth, have a wonderful evening. Thank you.